But now we're up to the big point of geometry, of chassis geometry. Now, making your bike do a lot of this stuff, if you don't have wheel bouncing and hopping kind of problems, um, now it comes down to getting the bike to turn the way we want, go to where we want to go on the turn, and leave the turn the way we want it to leave. All of those things are the chassis geometry, okay? Now, <coughs> everybody, we talked earlier about um, uh, ride heights and moving things, right? Um, now we want to, so you understand what we're going to do. If we, want, if we want to move the front of the bike, we're going to move the forks up and down in the triple clamps. If we want to raise and lower the back of the bike, we're going to use that ride height adjuster on our aftermarket shock, which we all have. Right? Um, <coughs> uh, some stock bikes have um, provisions for this. So uh, on a frame, a GSX-R, for instance, and some of the Hondas have a uh, clevis at the top you can put shims under. And uh, Kawasaki's have actually a relatively easy one to use. Um, they've got a ride height adjuster nut and everything built right into the chassis. Um, Yamaha R1, R6, you just got to buy a shock. You're, you, know, you can't do it, you can't get around it hardly, right? Anything without a ride height adjuster that you want to perform well on a racetrack, you just got to have some way to raise the back of the bike. Okay. There is no bike I know of currently that has adequate swing arm angle to ride it around a racetrack quickly, right? Um, so uh, you will, or fast, let's put it that way. Um, the uh, and I'll explain why this is so important. Now, <coughs> uh, I guess first what I'll do is explain what swing arm angle is and why it's so important, and then we'll get into telling you which end of the bike to move for what circumstance, all right? Um, when we talk about swing arm angle, we're talking about that angle from horizontal down to this imaginary axis, right? Now, most street bikes come with extremely flat swing arm angles. When we get them into race trim, again with the bike hanging, all these numbers I mentioned earlier, that's always with the bike hanging, you know, all the, everything loose and free. You know, the range will be uh, somewhere between 12 and 13 degrees for a fast bike, all right? Now, what we're dealing with here is uh, mechanical properties that, uh, the, that, the, that the wheel and swing arm apply to the shock once you've opened the throttle on the bike, all right? Now, <clears throat> what plays into this is the chain and sprockets, all right? Well, what we're dealing with is a lifting, pr a lifting property, and it's called anti-squat. Everybody heard of, everybody's heard of, first of all, squat, right? And the back of the bike sits down when you're trying to accelerate, right? Now, your bike has a property called anti-squat, and it's relevant to the angle that the swing arm has, okay? If you take your bike and go butt it up against the wall and put it in first gear and ease out on the clutch, it'll, it'll lift, you know? If, and with it being pinched against the wall, it, it'll lift. And really what's happening is this wheel is trying to rotate, and there's a force applied at the axle here, right? And it, it ends up as a lifting force up here at the swing arm pivot, right? It ends up as a lifting force, okay? Now, this is called anti-squat. The opposite is called pro-squat. If you had a dirt bike and you put two people on it, which they come with really flat swing arm angles, right? You could sit on it, put it against the wall, let out on the clutch slightly, and it would mechanically drop itself, okay? That's when the circumstance that happens there is where the swing arm is in theory and neutral is when everything is lined up, all right? Um, and for the real engineers in the house, we, ha we have a, uh, there's a second factor to this. And where the real angle of anti-squat exists is somewhere between the drive line of the chain and the swing arm angle, okay? The, because the chain and sprockets play a role in this, in this angle of anti-squat. So somewhere in between them is the real angle of anti-squat between the line of the swing arm and the top line of the chain and sprockets, okay? Now, if this line were to come above horizontal, then it moves into pro-squat, right? Now, we're trying to tune this thing to have the best combination of anti-squat properties and not end up in, in, uh, in pro-squat, all right? So, the, 
the steeper the swing arm angle, angle is, the more of this lifting force is applied. Now when you go to accelerate, you feel your bike sit back some, and it should. But the question is, how much, how much is that, right? Now if we were to have no anti-squat, it would really roll back hard, okay? Now if we have a ton of anti-squat, it may only sit back a little. But getting more anti-squat, the way we get it is with more swing arm angle, okay? Now, if you get to the point where you have so much swing arm angle, you, you actually can get to a point where you have so much swing arm angle that it won't squat hardly anymore. And that's when you can get direct wheel spin. Now, really, really fast guys like to be somewhere just a touch off of that point because they're looking to be able to crank that throttle on as hard as it can go with the biggest possible engine their tuner will give them and leave the turn as soon as they possibly can with the most possible force without spinning the tire, right? And so, they're trying to get to the magic place that is no wheel spin, but the, the most possible anti-squat. And that number typically falls somewhere around 12.7 on a sport bike. By the time bikes are at 13 degrees, they're spinning the wheel with a fast rider on it. And down there at 12, they're squatting pretty good, actually. It's a very, very, very narrow range. I mean, where tenths of degrees are noticeable to any, any fast rider, okay? Um, so, <coughs> So you can imagine now that changing the sprockets affects this, all right? It is a factor. So if this is our angle of our swing arm, this is our angle of the top line of our chains, and we have our you know, theoretical angle of anti-squat here. If we put a bigger sprocket on the rear, we changed our chain line to there, this has gotten flatter, and that bike will have a greater tendency to squat. Now, people are mis have misconceptions that it, if you just want to come up with the same final drive ratio with their gearing, then it has no effect on the bike, right? So if you were running 1545 and you went to 1648, people who don't know what they're talking about will say, ah, oh, it doesn't make any difference, just put that on there, it'll work the same, right? But it won't work the same. This will want to squat more, all right? Because you've actually changed it, changed the way it works, right? You've changed the mechanical properties of, of, the, of that bike and you've, you've now got less anti-squat in it. So, just be aware that your chain of sprockets are making subtle changes, and they are subtle um, to, to you, uh, the guy riding the bike. It, they are very subtle. So um, this isn't something where you're going to go to a 46 and go, oh my god, my bike fell apart, right? It's not going to be like that, right? Uh, do we have anybody that rides an older GSX-R, a pre, pre general you know, like a 97? None of them? There is one other instance that can occur. Um, to, that affects this, and that's if your drive chain lays over the swing arm pivot. By the time you try and crank your swing arm up to where you get a decent amount of anti-squat, if uh, the drive chain, I'm going to exaggerate this, lays over the swing arm pivot, when you go to accelerate that, this chain is trying to pull itself into a straight line. It'll actually mechanically squash the swing arm pivot down and it'll pull the bike down. So with the old GSX-Rs, if you had a 15 tooth countershaft sprocket on there, right? pretty much with any rear sprocket, it would rip the rubber guide off the swing arm and throw it out into your belly pan or onto the racetrack and then the chain would grind into the swing arm and your bike would be squatting and it, it took everybody a while to figure this out but don't ask me why, but you go to 16 no problem then the chain would lay you know off of the swing arm pivot and you wouldn't have these problems right now if you were to run that 15 tooth sprocket which is like I think it was stock and you have your swing arm in the stock location hey no problem Right? But, you know, in stock location, we know that that thing, when you crack the throttle, is just going to sit down and run wide. Now, <clears throat> so, the way this plays out on a racetrack, I got my turn. Here's my turn. Turn's no good. And I'm riding through the turn, and I come here, and I'm going to get on the throttle. And my bike runs out, and this is as soon as I can get on the throttle to stay on the racetrack. But this is with my stock swing arm angle, right? That's just as soon as I can get on the throttle, because if I get on it any sooner, I'm going to drive straight off the track, right? If you were to raise your swing arm angle into this race trim, into this race range, you know, take it from 9 or 10 or whatever it was stock and move it up, what will happen is you'll get on the throttle at that exact same place, and you're going to drive out here into the middle of the racetrack. And you'll go, what the heck happened there? You know, I had the throttle wide open. Well, all you've done is make it so the bike didn't squat and run wide off the racetrack. So now what happens is, you can get on the throttle back here. Now you get on the throttle back here, and you're back on this arc, right? And now you just, you know, took 
half five tenths off your lap time because you got on the throttle 30 yards sooner, right? It, and that's all it is. Just raise the back of the bike up. Now do that times 13 turns and see what it does to your lap time. You know, 13 times 0.5, and you might be shocked at how big a ride height change can make to a, a novice rider's bike. Particularly if you have the impression, you know, I'm going as fast as I can go. I got on the throttle as soon as I could get on the bike. I can't go any faster. If I do, I'm just going to drive off the track and crash. And then this, this, is where the, this is where the time really drops. And that's where, like when we started the whole seminar today, why does Opie Kaler go 10 seconds a lap faster than you on the same bike with the same tires on the same day at the same track? You know, this can be one of the reasons, right? Wholesale seconds of time are cooped up in the chassis, right? Now, uh, here's another one of my analogies. Not going to find this anywhere else. Top secret stuff. Don't tell anybody this, what you're about to see. It's not that it's going to be on the video. We'll cut this part out. No. Uh, so we're going to call this our motorcycle, right? Here's the front. Here's the back. <clears throat> so you say, what am I supposed to move? What do I do, right? And I come, um, I don't know, my bike won't turn, my bike runs wide, my bike tries to tuck, I don't know what to do, what should I move, right? You need to know which end of the bike to turn and which end of the bike to adjust to get the most effect. Now, it should be obvious that if I raise the back of the motorcycle, right, I'm going to get more swing arm angle, but what happens in the front? As I raise the back, it noses in. I get less rake, less trail, right? Now, if I lower the back, the opposite happens, right? Becomes more like, you know, uh, more rake, more trail, more stable, so on. If I take the front of the bike, if I lower the front of the bike, um, less, less rake, less trail, but my swing arm angle flattens out, right? I'm rolling my bike down, my swing arm gets flatter. So, no matter what you change, you're affecting both ends of the motorcycle. So you say, geez, I, you know, all I want is my bike to turn better. I don't want to screw everything up. So you need to know where it's going to go to to have the most effect and have the least effect on the other end of the bike. Now, in our turn, we can sort of make our track here, right? <coughs> the most common mistake I see people make is they say, my bike won't turn. And the old school tuner in the pit's going to say, hey, go raise the back of the bike up. It'll help your bike turn in. Now, my analogy is that if you move the front of the bike, forks up and down, you're going to affect the way it enters the turn, a quantity of five. You're going to affect the way it leaves the turn, a quantity of one. All right? If we take the back of the motorcycle, and we raise or lower the back of the bike, we're going to affect the way it leaves the turn, a quantity of five, and we're going to affect the way it enters the turn, a quantity of one. So if your bike won't turn in, and an old school tuner guy comes and tells you to crank the back of the bike up, you helped it turn, but you really affected the way it leaves the turn. Maybe you didn't want it to do that, right? Maybe your bike already left the turn good and you had good swing arm angle and the bike didn't squat and it ran off the turn properly. But now you just raise the back of the bike up. You really changed the way it leaves the turn, but you only barely affected the way it enters the turn, okay? So we want to find the end of the bike that has the biggest impact. Now, in the case of the way you, I divide this is, here's our throttle point wherever it was. That's when I choose which end of the bike to go for. All the way from braking to turn in to mid-turn, if my problem occurs in that range, that's the front of the bike. So my bike won't turn. My bike turns too good. It's trying to fold up on me. And my bike won't make it to the apex. And it's just not getting there. Any of these signs and symptoms, we're going to move the forks up and down in the triple clamps. We're going to try and get the front of the bike to do what we want it to do. All right? Now, anything that happens that you, about the bike that you don't like, from the moment you pull the throttle open, we're going to go for the back of the bike. Okay. So if the bike squats and runs wide, the wheel spins, something's going on, right? You get an instant wheel spin. We need to go to the back of the bike to fix that. All right? So this is one of the most useful tuning tips in the world. You can go through the AMA paddock. There isn't probably 10 people that know that there. It's unbelievable how many people just don't know where to move the chassis around to get the most result, right? And, uh, this information will help you a ton because you will not be screwing up your bike um, by grabbing the wrong thing. 
Now, again, a lot of suspension shops will help you with baseline settings as far as, you know, geometry once you've had forks set up and whatnot. Um, uh, sometimes that's fee based, sometimes it's included as part of the service. Um, you just need to find the company you want to deal with for that kind of stuff. Um, we, I had talked earlier about fork extenders and um, you know, I know people were curious as to why we would extend a fork. So we want to address some reasons uh, to, you know, why uh, we might extend the front fork on a motorcycle. And uh, you know, we had talked and everybody said that they felt like their stock street bike turned pretty quickly and pretty aggressively. Now a couple of reasons for that are in stock trim the, 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 the chassis geometry, the fork geometry is typically not that bad. You'll have pretty aggressive rake and trail numbers and everything looks zoomy. And that's accented by the fact that they've got really soft springs in it. So the bike tends to ride with its nose down, which just makes it steer faster. You know, no way around it. So a lot of people will notice if they just put stiffer springs in, now they get their, you know, the, 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 you know, the ride height of the bike restored to, to say somewhere around normal, and they'll feel the bike steer slower. You know, although it'll be better under braking and better under, you know, a million other situations, they'll say, mm, it doesn't steer as fast now that I've done that. And they may end up raising the tubes up in the clamps to get it to restore some of that stock steering feel, right, after that. But, so what would be the reason we would extend these forks? Since, you know, we're saying, oh, if we, by the time we respring them, the bike keeps coming up and that's making it steer slower and slower. Well, when we take a stock bike with, you know, no swing arm angle, you know, or just terrible swing arm angles, you know, some of them are nine or 10 degrees, right? And now we've got our, real trick racy steering geometry. When we crank the back of this bike up into race trim somewhere around 12 and a half degrees, this thing's gotten really steep. And then they're not very safe. You know, they'll be extremely nervous, extremely dangerous, even, if, even with the forks, you know, with just the cap sticking up above the clamp. So then we extend the forks internally about 10 millimeters. They kind of end up back at this racing geometry. But now we've got the swing arm angle, we need to go, go around a racetrack proficiently, right? So it's, you know, five to, you know, most extender kits are between seven and 10 millimeters. And, um, and that's enough to make up the difference in that. Now, the reason we got to tune a bike that way, we got to tune it back first and front last is simply because, like I said, we're dealing with mechanical, physical principles here. We, we can't change this. You know, we got to get the bike to leave the turn first. Once we get the bike to leave the turn properly, then we need to make sure the, the steering works right after that. So this is just the sequence. There's no way around this. If you get the steering geometry right and then try and fool with the back, you've just, you've just made a mess out of it. And in, in reality, like I said, we, we can't control this. It's going to do what it wants to do. When you pull the throttle open, you got to have the right amount of anti-squat. If you don't, you're just not going to go fast, right? So um, that's kind of the, uh, the idea behind the, the fork extender and why we would do that. Um, so. Um, uh, during one of the breaks, some people had talked about lowering bikes, and you know that's a hard thing. Um, you know, a lot of people don't have a long enough inseam to be able to either stand comfortably in traffic or stand well on the track. And uh, I always try and steer them to everything they can possibly do to uh, scoop the seat out. You know, have a double tall boot. You know, have an extra thick sole put on. Whatever they can do, uh, other than trying to lower the back of the bike down, because when we do that, we've we've compromised the chassis. Now with uh, some shock manufacturers, we can have a shock. I had an, uh, I've done this for a few people. We've built a shock that's actually shorter than stock by half an inch. Most ride height adjusters are half an inch. So for the person's daily riding, they can drop the bike down half an inch. At, and at the shock, that's a lot out by the wheel. It's an inch and a half or something. So lowers the bike substantially. But then when they want to go to the track day or do an aggressive twisty road, you know, it's f two, two minutes work to crank the ride height adjuster up back to stock at least and then they can ride. Maybe they'll be on tiptoes just for a little bit while they're riding, but uh, th then they can ride the bike and, and get more enjoyment out of the chassis and, and under aggressive use. Um, so, uh, everybody get kind of clear on, on geometry? Any, any questions about that?